On today's show, father of four who goes all the way to Russia to rescue the adopted daughter he's never even seen except in a dream. I said, she's in trouble. We've got to find her. And I know where she is, but I don't know how to get to her. Then, a renegade public defender who defends the homeless and helps them navigate the confusion of our court system. Justice can be served outside on a handball court, behind a fold-out table, in a community room. It is a process and an attitude as much as a structure. And in our Rising Star segment, 2004 American Idol finalist and award-winning gospel singer George Huff performs right here. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, put up your feet. I'm Naomi Judd, and it's a brand new morning. Every day's a new day. Every day's a new way. To help somebody who needs somebody like you There's a power you can pass along To heal a heart and make it strong There's hope with every dawn Every day's a new day we start our crazy week I love starting my week this way with you all uh, to get some inspiring stories to get me ready for whatever lies ahead this week you know there are some things uh, that are just worth so much that we're willing to pay any kind of price and for me of course it's my husband it's my kids it's my grandkids my children my faith and my, my country America so today we're going to be asking you what will you go to the mat for we're going to meet some people willing to move heaven and earth because they found out their mission. But here's a lawyer. He's definitely a public defender. He defends the homeless who live in public on the streets of San Diego. Charles Hayes. My office, please. Welcome back. How you doing? Every time I think about the terrible things I've done, I call upon the guilt I feel from where my life begun. My family didn't have everything to guide me every year, but what they had, they shared it all to keep me from being here. Take it from me, one who knows, police are coast to coast. So if ever your mind leads you astray, remember these words of wisdom. Slip and slide all you want, you cannot beat the system. Drugs is, and alcohol has been pretty much the highlight of my life uh, from from, from Vietnam, from being a veteran, from being homeless, trying to find a course of direction. And uh, I wound up in jail. Uh, as a result, uh, I had to deal with the tickets and uh, uh, the setbacks that the court puts on an individual when you, when you get caught up in that, in that circle. Remain seated, come to order. This court is now in session. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We could hit people with fines, we can threaten them with custody, but if they're homeless when they get into custody, they're homeless when they're released from custody. The idea came from my frustration and my fr despair, being an attorney in the traditional court setting. Why don't we try and get the court to go out to the homeless and the needy? And so they set up a regular court, regular judge, it's just like a regular trial. We realize justice can be served outside on a handball court, behind a fold-out table, underneath camo netting, in a community room. It is a process and an attitude as much as a structure. The only way to get into the homeless court setting is a referral from any one of a number of homeless service agencies. We purposely structured it that way so that participation in the homeless court is voluntary. They'll trust us that they won't get arrested. They get justice because they got tickets for things you and I would not think of important. Uh, sleeping on the, in somebody's doorway. Justice is, okay, you make up for your crime. The way the Holmes Court is set up, it addresses the underlying cause of the citations, and it helps the individual put that, what that citation represents behind them. Stand in battles, standing before the court, Your Honor, she's from the Strive Second Chance Program. But the whole point is to give an individual some quality of life by meeting the court halfway, and they can go out and be productive citizens. So I think we're, it's a win-win situation. 
court can give orders, but if an individual's not in a position to follow those orders, justice is hollow. The court is rewarded in the homeless court setting by the contributions of the homeless service agencies and the participants. Your Honor, Mr. Hines is present. He's from Veterans Village of San Diego. He's been residing here for the past eight months plus. The one that I'm dealing with now pertains to my driver's license. I have $2,000 worth of uh, fines that uh, I'm hoping to have resolved. You need your driver's license? Well, yes. as soon as you complete the program, you'll be able to get it. We as homeless people, or we as just people that are, that are coming up short, uh, we don't have the resources to get in and out of court systems. And uh, this type of program is, is helping all of us. I was on the street four years. Once I got to this program and realized the safety net that was here, uh, it gave me the opportunity to just be able to worry about me. Uh, I didn't have to turn around or look over my shoulder or worry about the police coming. I was relaxed to a point where I got peace of mind. I got air to my brain. It gave me room to grow. Finally over. Finally over. I can drive again. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> a lot of people look at the homeless population as getting what they deserve. In reality, it, sadly, it's a lack of opportunity for the folks on the street. They're looking for a way to participate in society more fully. They need an opportunity as much as anyone else. Their daily struggle is food, clothing, and shelter. Where I'm going today, I do have a plan and a thought, and uh, I do have hope. I know from now on I can make it. All I gotta do is just keep doing what I'm doing, and uh, things will be all right. I'm intimidated by and con confused by the judicial system. Man, you know, I've got my clergy friends here with me today, my sidekicks, but you never kicked me in the side of you, Otis. No, 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 I'm going to pass Otis Moss, Reb, Rabbi Sherry Hirsch. Um, yeah, they're good ones, too. Your thoughts, because you were going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, uh -huh. absolutely, the whole thing. I think this needs to be replicated throughout the country because I believe that uh, we sometimes look at things from the perspective of being of a person of privilege. And if you are homeless, you're already serving some type of sentence. Yeah. And I think that a community, a nation, a society is judged by what we do for the least of these and not for those who just have privilege. But I, I believe Jesus said that. Absolutely. <laughs> but Otis, I was thinking you said something too, is we think the homeless are other, That's but right. they're made in God's image just like That's us. Right. The homeless are B'Tselem Elohim, creations of God. And it's easy to forget that. What is it, But Selim Elohim is the Hebrew word from the Bible. And you live in Beverly Hills. I do. So tell us about the situation. Well, in Santa Monica, it's, I was thinking when you said you're very intimidated by the justice system, I think the first time I got pulled over, I cried. And the system in Santa Monica, there is so much homeless. And people walk by, they don't even notice. And it's become, they've become indifferent, which I think is much more dangerous and scary than becoming passionate and I think Stephen's reminding us of that. Sometimes when I stop to talk to them on the street, as a nurse I see that they have medical problems mm -hmm. and they're obviously developmentally challenged or whatever. Uh, so you would, you would well, send them to rehab after, after this? Well, send them to the hospital or to rehab? Well or? it's interesting, this morning I was walking by a church just as I was coming here and a homeless man gave another homeless woman in front of the church a Sudoku game and I realized every human being needs human connection and they need to play, and it doesn't matter where you live. And I think it's the responsibility of <laughs> every church to have some type of, of homeless ministry, especially if you're claiming to serve a savior um, who was homeless. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place uh, to lay his head. So, I mean, I yeah. think that you must make a connection and a commitment if you claim to serve a savior who was homeless. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's homeless. <laughs> yeah. Jesus donkey, was homeless. Huh? I have to think about yeah. that, Otis. Homeless, homeless. I really have to think about yeah. that. Oh, next up, a disturbing dream wakes a father in the middle of the night and sends him off on a rescue mission to Russia. And then later on the show, American Idol George Huff is in the house. The next story is about one man's passion. Had he just had a dream, or was this a vision from God? Just before Christmas in the year 2002, 
Rick Solanskis, woke his wife up and told her about this very strange dream that he had of a frightened child down in a basement in Russia. Well, he's wide awake now and on a years-long adventure. Let's watch. We have four children. Tony and Maria this year will graduate from college, and Andrew will go into eighth grade. Jessica is in high school. And basically, we were looking forward to the house emptying out a little bit, basically. That was it. Everyone thinks their father is crazy, and yes, he does act crazy in many situations. My parents said, you know, we have something to talk to you about. He said, Mom, he said, he said if I start crying, don't get upset. Well, that really scared me. He began to tell us the story of the dream that he had on December 23rd at 3 o'clock in the morning. I was standing on a pair of, of, of basement steps, and there were people standing around me. I can't tell you who those individuals were, but I was absolutely positively sure they knew me very well. And we're looking down the steps. If you look down the stairs and you look off to the left-hand side, the corner of the wall had been looked, appeared to have been like blown out or damaged in some way, and there was a cavernous area that you would walk behind that had a little glow of red light coming from behind it. This little child looks out from behind that wall. A little girl. She looks so sad. And I reached over and I picked her up and I held her in my arms. But she put her arms around my neck. And I started to walk up the steps. And standing at the very top of the stairs in the doorway was my wife Stephanie. And I took this child to Stephanie. And as I reached her, I woke up. And I could tell by looking at him, something was worrying him there. And he said he had a dream of a little girl that was down in the basement and that he looked down the stairs and saw her and went down and got her. I know this doesn't sound right. I said, but there is no doubt in my mind that that, that child I had physically held in my arms, physically held that baby in my arms. I said, she's in trouble. We've got to find her. And I know where she is, but I don't know how to get to her. That night I went up and I was looking on the internet and every time I typed something into the internet, one name kept coming up. It said on their open door, adoption. Rick called me on December 26th day after Christmas. I think he was really surprised that anyone was at the office and told me that he had had a very vivid dream about a specific child that he felt God was speaking to him through this dream that he was to go and adopt this child. I said, I know I'm calling you out of the blue. I said, but I really need to share something with you. And if you think I'm crazy, you tell me and I'll move on to wherever God tells me to go. I told him, of course not. God speaks to people in different ways. It's a biblical truth that how God reveals something to one person may not be the same as God reveals even the same thing to a different person. I called my dear friend Armando and the following Thursday we met at a restaurant and spent most of the day there. I've done sketches like this, just, you know, portraits, you know, years and years and years. So, you know, the portraiture part of it is not that difficult for me. Um, getting an exact representation of what somebody's trying to describe to me is the difficult part. Armando sat there and started drawing. Many, many, many hours later, he finished. And he was just very excited. And when he saw the girl, he was very moved, I could see, with the fact that, you know, this was exactly what he saw in his dream. And I went home and showed Stephanie the picture. And that night, we emailed it to Ed Thomas. I've never had one, someone tell me that they had a vivid dream about a specific child to the point of being able to have a sketch artist draw a picture. A couple weeks later on a Wednesday morning I went to work and about 11 o'clock in the morning my wife Stephanie calls me at work and she said, uh, Rick, we just got a phone call from the agency that was doing the home study, checking our family out for adoption, for approval for adoption. She said, our home study is complete. And sure enough, uh, the day that the home study agency called Rick to tell him that the home study was completed. He went back on that website and there was one picture added in it and it was the, the picture of, of his daughter, Nadia. It's quite remarkable. I'm sitting there looking face to face 
with the very little child I held in my arms in that dream. The child, not a, like a representation of some child, the little girl. And I, my secretary came in, I started crying, I called my wife, I had talked Stephanie through how to get on the computer, and she, she saw her, and there was no doubt it was her. The entire thing has been uh, amazing and special, and, and the fact that, that we found this child on this website that matched this drawing. They contact Russia, and they start the process. We, in total 100% faith, walked forward knowing that little girl would be our daughter and that we would go there and we would bring her home. I'd never even dreamt in my wildest dream that I'd ever be going to Russia, more or less to go get my daughter. We walked up those steps in that orphanage and we sat in a little waiting room and it seems like just seconds later they brought her to the door and there she was and they gave her a little nudge and she walked right over into our arms. And it was as though we had never, ever been apart. You see, Nadia was born in a town about 200 kilometers from where her orphanage was located. They looked for her mother for 12 months. In the end, they tracked her down in hospital because she'd been sick. And they said, okay, you know, we're looking after the child, do you want her? And they said, no, she signed her over. And they said, oh, look, they signed her over on the 23rd. And Nadezhda Nadia became available for adoption. On the very day I had that dream, it's just like when a child had been born, and, and you walk and look in that window, and they, and they open the little blinds and you see that little baby, and you wait for that moment, you say, what a miracle. And Nadia was no different. I'll never forget the feeling that I had when I saw him walking with that little girl. I knew that it was our little girl. She has changed our lives as much as most likely we will end up changing hers. It's like God, through this child, looked into my heart and smiled. Amazing as the story is, it doesn't end here. I'm here right now with Rick Solanskis and his wife Stephanie, and as soon as we come back, we're going to find out more about what this unbelievable family is up to. And we're going to meet the real Nadia. Stick around. Yay. We're back now with Rick and Stephanie Salonkas. And in a minute, we're going to get to meet Nadia, the daughter Rick dreamed about. So tell us about what has life been like since you brought Nadia back from Russia. What's amazing, Naomi, is that from the time that she walked into our home, it was as though Nadia was never not there. It was, um, Stephanie and I had a discussion about this at one point, it was, it was like she was born of her womb and someone fast forwarded the tape. It was <laughs> like she was never not with us. We can never think of a moment that she was not with us. And the boys, your, your older sons, were in the makeup room while we were getting her curls and everything, and they were videotaping her, and I mean, just like they're, she's this thing on a pedestal with them. Oh, absolutely. But she is a little sister too, though. What'd you think when he woke you in the middle of the night and said he had this dream? Oh. <laughs> Did you think he'd been hit in the head and rendered <laughs> unconscious for half an hour? I think you think very fast, like all these things kind of go through your mind. I tend to sort of think, okay, what does this mean, rather than quite as literally as he did that. Yeah. From the moment I brought her home, I knew in my heart I had to return to Russia, that she was not the end of a miracle. She was the beginning of what I was to do with the rest of my life. So you found a Project Anna, the Anna Pro Foundation? I formed the Project Anna Foundation just so I would have the nucleus to accomplish what I was doing. I knew I had to use all my talents, all the gifts God gave me, because I realized something, that this world wasn't about me. That's what hit me through this whole thing. It wasn't about Rick Solanskis. It was about what I would use my gifts for to touch others' lives. And those children in Russia are my paramount focus. You're talking about situations with no running water, no sanitation, no central heat. Uh, a little under a million children in the orphanages alone. And the most wonderful people in your, that I've ever met in my life, but they have so little. 
So I knew I had to go, and I went. The second time I went back, and I started going village to village, hospital to hospital, baby home to baby home. And I knew that it was just driving me till the day God takes me off this earth. They say the best way to make a dream come true is to wake up. Where is she? She's right here. Come on, Nadia. <laughs> here on this side so everybody can see we got curls in the dressing room <laughs> we got curls and your two brothers were taking pictures of you and you told them to go away right <laughs> why because they was because they were being on the ring <laughs> being on <laughs> is that russian for <laughs> mischievous <laughs> tell me what you like about your daddy and your mommy? I like my daddy because he takes me um, to Disney World. To Disney World! <laughs> and what do you like about your mommy? Because he, she gives me um, good food. She gives you, you what? Good food? Good food? <laughs> like vegetables. Vegetables. Vegetables! <laughs> Are you real? Are you real? What's your favorite soup? Broccoli soup. <laughs> Broccoli soup? You are just the bee's knees. Do you know what that means? It means I think you're wonderful. And thank you guys for being with us today. Thank you. Really appreciate your, your presence and your story. Next up, we've got a teenager's escape from slavery, but it's right here in America. Next Sunday, wake up to a new morning. You all know what time it is? With Naomi Judd. Tune in as Naomi shares stories of real people beating the odds. I understand 21 months sober. Yeah. yeah. Facing their fears and never losing hope. Each week, we pose a provocative question. How do you describe love? I was so excited to hear that this was a topic for today's show. And I'm so happy to get to share what I've discovered. Naomi's New Morning, next Sunday morning at 7 and 10 on Hallmark Channel. And we've been talking about the limits to which we'll go when we find something we really feel passionate about. So are you guys aware how many kids from overseas are sold into slavery? I mean, here, here in the States, tens of thousands. And our next guest was one such a child. Take a look at this. Given Kuchepa was only 11 years old when he was brought to the United States, he was an orphan living in crushing poverty in Zambia when a U.S.-based trafficker promised him an education, free clothes, and even the chance to earn money to build schools back home, all if he would just sing in the all-boys choir in churches across the United States. But once here, Given saw that it was all a lie. Oh, I'm so honored to have Given, I want to say it right, Ku Chingpa with us today. Now, he was the one featured uh, in uh, the piece there, but he was also in, in a recent issue of Teen People magazine as one of the top 20 teens who's going to make a positive impact on the world. Please help me welcome Given. <laughs> and I know you're nervous because this is your first interview, but, yeah. you, but you're okay with me. Uh -huh. So tell us you were 11, you were orphaned, and they told you if you joined the choir, you're going to get a salary and food. And Yeah, um, growing up, I had a, a hard child childhood. And then um, I lost my parents when I was really young. So I started going to church, you know, with the hopes of uh, helping out my family. And I joined the Zambian Acapella Boys Choir, and I came to the States. Um, and a lot of promises that, you know, the ministry that brought me to the States were not being fulfilled. Um, I pretty much became a slave when I got to the States. Uh, the ministry that I was singing for, um, you know, told me to sing four to seven concerts a day. Um, many days um, I had to get up at 4.30 a.m. to travel to sing. Um, if you, you was you didn't get food or and you didn't get the money and all no, the stuff they promised. No, there was no food. There was no money, um, and a lot of times, you know, if you were sick, you still you were expected to sing because the ministry said you know you had to sing. Uh, we didn't have anybody to tell, to talk to about our problems because if you did, uh, if the ministry found out that you were telling anybody, they would want to deport you back home to your country, and that would be a disgrace because in your in Zambia. You know, you're raised up and 
they expect good things to come from you when you come you go to the states. So um, I remember one time we even had to uh, hand dig a swimming pool in July what? in Texas. Yes, ma'am. In Texas? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It was pretty excruciating because I was only 11 years of age. Uh, I didn't have a choice whether to do it or not to do it. I just had to do it. And then right after that, you know, we would go out and you know have a concert like an hour. And then if you haven't had anything to eat, you're exhausted. You can't really sing like they want you to do. So I'm curious. You were in churches. Did you have any connection with God, even though all this horrible stuff was going on? It was. It was what kept me on going. It was ah. what kept me going because I knew that God was a savior. I knew he was going to be there for me eventually. I mean, there were a lot of times when we would just sit down as a group and pray and just knew that, you know, he was going to be there. And at 11 years of age, when you don't have anybody to talk to, you know, you lost your parents, uh, you don't have anybody to talk to, you just, God was the only thing that, you know, you had connection with. So yes. how did you meet Sandy? Um, that was after the uh, immigration got involved and they found out about all the problems. And, um, you know, they took us to our first Baptist college, and then we found Sandy, my mom. Uh -huh. And um, people from that church helped me find a place, and I, I moved on with my life. I've got to, we've got to bring Sandy on. Sandy Shepherd, his legal guardian, is going to join us now. <laughs> we were talking in uh, hair and makeup, and the first thing you said is that we've got to tell the world about these situations. How did you get involved? I got involved in the ministry and helped as a host home, helped the church find homes for the boys when they were traveling around and touring in different cities. And the more times that we were able to host them and build up a trust level, then we became aware of some issues that they were telling us that were happening behind the scenes, that their mail was being opened, money had been taken out of the envelopes. Ah. We were aware that we were not supposed to treat them as host homes if they were sick. We were supposed to tell the road manager, but in one boy's case, the family did take him to the hospital, and he had active TB. The ministry had not HIV or TB tested any of these oh, boys. Man. So these, these kids are also being used, in traffic, trafficked in prostitution, in factories, and in farms. How bad is this situation? Tens of thousands? Well, the estimates at this point are between twelve and 17,000 per year brought into our country, but the global number that they use is 27 million people around the world are enslaved, more than any other time in history. As a victim of human trafficking, I wanted to make a difference. And so what we did, me and my mom, and we, we just became available to any kind of media that we could just to educate people, you know, my friends at school, teachers, um, just all over the country, and that's what I've been doing. This is human life that, you know, somebody else is taking advantage of. And I can remember, you know, being in that and hoping that somebody else would do something to get me out of that situation. And if I don't do anything about it, if the government does not do anything about it, these problems will continue going and, you know, the predicament will just get worse. And we have to fight, and that's what I've been doing. That's what I'm willing to fight for. You took something out of nothing. I mean, you took the most hideous uh, betrayal of trust and everything. And look what you're doing. Um, yeah, it, it's amazing just to see what God can do. Um, and human trafficking is something that it is so hidden that you don't know it is happening. Like in my case, I mean, we were going in different places around the country, uh, singing, smiling, telling people about Christ, and nobody would have ever known that, you know, something was going on. And the only way to be able to tell is to um, get to know the person. And you, Missy, have started a school in Zambia? Yes, my energy shifted with one of the choirs to Zambia, and we started a school to fulfill the promise that had been made to them, that they would be able to finish school. And that school is still running. It's now become a private school in the community and has about 105 students. <laughs> Those boys that were here finished their education. And we just feel, I just feel just so blessed because we have three biological daughters and we just really feel like God brought us a son with Given being part of our family now for six years. Can you believe this? And if you want to see ways that you can help out, please go to our website at faithstreams.com and uh, find out more about this unbelievable story. Thank you, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Awesome story. 
And you did good, your first TV interview. <laughs> Next up, we've got some more friends. We've got our day one diner circle. They're gonna talk about what happens when a single woman wants a child so much. But what does that mean? That's coming up next. Evening at 7 and 10 on Hallmark Channel. Hello. We've been talking about what you're willing to fight for, and I'm back with Sherry and, and Otis and checking in with our friends at the Day One Diner about a topic that wasn't around 20 years ago. No, it's, it's, a, a, it's a new kind topic. Kind of a sensitive issue yeah. for you all. Should a single mom, a single woman, raise a child on her own? Well, I know a lot about that, raising one in a nation. But by mine. choice. No, mine, by wasn't, choice. mine wasn't by choice. So well, how did you guys wind up? Well, this was an interesting discussion because this is one, what you all don't see is that a lot of times we keep talking, uh, and yeah. sometimes the discussions get heated and they have to you know, kind of calm us down. Yeah. Um, and this is one of those discussions that kept going um, about if someone makes a choice that I want to have a child, I'm single, and there were a variety of different perspectives. Yeah, so I, I think you'll enjoy this. Did you take away the sharp knives? <laughs> uh, we had to, yes. <laughs> well, let's see. Say you have a friend uh, that uh, decides that they want to have a child and uh, they have no prospects for marriage. How, how do you communicate with them? How do you engage them in terms of these issues? I, I think the first thing to talk about is that being a parent is difficult mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. being a single parent is extra difficult. So once you get past that point, I, I think it is a possible thing. One of the associate pastors at my church said, you know, I, I waited and waited for my knight in shining armor to come along and he didn't come along. And so she went into an adoption process and adopted two children uh, over a period of about five years from India. And she's a great parent. I am continually amazed by what a good mom she is to these two little kids. So is there a difference between adoption, in vitro fertilization, having a relationship with someone you're not married, and then raising uh, a yes, child? Yes, of course. There's a big <laughs> difference in all of those things. Uh, in adoption, uh, the child has been conceived uh, elsewhere, otherwise and you're bringing them into your family and in many ways rescuing them to some extent from a situation that could be very terrible or difficult. Uh, that's a totally different thing, I think, to choose then to uh, have sex outside of marriage with someone and have a child knowing full well when you start this relationship you don't intend to be married. I think the definition of being a parent or rearing a child is really that there's one unconditional person that loves you. And we see that all the time. There's plenty of sets of parents that do a terrible job and plenty of individuals that do a wonderful job. Well, and I think the resources available to this single parent is a question. I think, Scott, maybe that's where you were headed. That uh, is there support? Um, is there monetary um, resources available for this person? Because parenting is hard, uh, as we know, um, just when you have resources, when you have a support system, when you have a faith community that is around you. So I think thinking through what it means to be a but, single parent. Wait a minute. Is it appropriate faith-wise for someone to say, I'm going to, by traditional means, as mm -hmm. Otis has said, outside of marriage, mm -hmm. conceive a child knowing that I'm not going to be married and have this child purposefully. Now, if I don't believe that it damages the child or the child is any less mm -hmm. of a person or a, or a being or uh, has any less right. privileges or anything like that. I don't, you know, I don't go there. But I am saying this act in itself, I believe, is, is mm -hmm. against Scripture. So is the method the issue more so than... I, it can't, uh, yeah, it can't right. be it the can't issue. Be and I'm so stuck with Well, some Billy methods, said. yes. I think some methods are the issue for me. And that I think it goes beyond that, too. And it does go to the single parent uh, issue and what that means and how family is defined. I think that's very important for all of us to grapple with in our faith tradition. But I don't... Billy, I have to argue against you vehemently because God did not say you should be a parent and you should not be a parent. There's so many complexities and plenty of women. God's come saying that every day. I mean, life is saying that. Uh, that yeah, but plenty people of people can be could parents be great can't parents, be. but they don't have the typical. They haven't found the right man, and they're 39 or 40, and they know they could be a fabulous parent, and everybody else knows it. So you're saying. You know, Scripture tells us mm -hmm. that the ideal family is a man and a woman. What if they haven't found you know, someone? Parenting is a vocation. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to be a parent to be what God is calling you to right. be. 
But if God is calling you to be a parent, I think then, you know, then adoption, then in vitro fer fertilization may be options that, that you, that you want to consider, um, it, you know. But you have to go into it with eyes wide open. It is it in. fair to that child? to bring them into that situation. I think sometimes we get very selfish. You know, this is what I want. I want to be a parent. I want this in my life. But stop for a moment and say, now, is it fair to this child? It may indeed be, but is it fair for but this that, child to be brought subjective? into this situation by choice? You know, some right, are, but by that's not, very not subjective. I mean, what's fair to a child is someone who unconditionally loves that child. And the Plenty most fair to a child is two someones that unconditionally love them, according a mother and a father, according, according to, to the scripture. Really? That is not according to the scripture. Sure. We're reading different books. My heart's pumping really fast, and I'm sitting <laughs> on the edge of my seat here. Okay, before the show, I always go out and talk to the audience, and we knew this was coming up. And Regina, right here in the front row, you had something real interesting to say. Speak your mind now. Yes, Naomi. Um, as a Catholic Christian, um, I find a woman who, a single woman, who chooses to have a child out of wedlock or through in vitro fertilization is objectionable. Um, she's really not uh, focusing on doing the Lord's will as much as doing her own will. And um, when she is choosing that, it's really selfish, actually, because she is um, looking out for what she wants as opposed to the best interest of the child. Um, now, adoption, on the other hand, uh, it, it's preferable, again, for a man and a woman to adopt a child. However, if a single woman is able to provide a child, uh, rescue a child from a situation, then that's a good thing. Oh, two interesting phrases, perfect world. I totally agree. If you got a man and a woman and they think about it and they're economically and emotionally ready and mature, bingo. Okay, but the other word, which is in the real world of practical, is the word rescue. Did I hear the word rescue? I have a girlfriend, Dina DeVito, one of the most Christian women I've ever met in my life. She teaches Sunday school. She's in her 40s. He hasn't come along. She consulted with her family who actually live in the, in the suburb that she lives in, and they decided they're rescuing a child from, uh, she's rescuing a child from mm -hmm. Russia. Wasn't God a single parent, Naomi? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that yep. says it all. That says it all for me. Adam and Eve, one God. Yeah. And Christ was born to a, to a single mother. Okay. Uh, and uh, you have a, a, a father. Who was a teenager. Who was a teenager. And then you have a father come in there and say, well, I'm not quite sure about this. Because originally, he, you know, Joseph said, I do not want to be with yeah. you. Woo, we want to hear about you on these topics. This is exactly why we have this show. Yeah, I, know. Sure. I want people to talk about this around their supper table, around the water cooler on Monday mm -hmm. morning. And if you have thoughts on this, bring it on. We want to hear. Uh, maybe you want the day one diner to talk about it. Maybe you want to hear from the authorities over here. Go to Naomi's message board at our faithstreamswebsite.com. Click on feedback. <sighs> Don't go away. We've got a whole lot more. We're going to meet 2004 American Idol finalist George Huff. Great music. Is he your favorite? <laughs> We've been hearing stories about people who, for so many different reasons, have sweat-stained experiences when they decided to find and then confront whatever mattered most to them. And I'm back with my sidekick, Otis Ma, Sherry Hurst, and uh, mm -hmm. my friend Timberly Whitfield, <laughs> gracious host of Weekdays. New morning. Uh, so th this is a theme that I've watched you, you all talk about your beliefs and your values. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, recently, recently we met a woman who challenged the roles of women in the workplace by following her dream to become the captain of her own lobster boat. What? This, what? this was, this was, well, here's the, that's, here's the real, real clincher. This was 50 plus years ago what? when women weren't doing this kind of work. I mean, it's gritty, down and dirty work. Uh, physical work. And, and she's the uh, only woman, obviously. And she's doing it still and mentoring others, men mentoring other young women now. Isn't that fabulous? I mean, that, that was to worth... To be captains of a lobster was, boat. That was worth fighting for, for her. Sister lobster. That's all right. <laughs> 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 all right, we're rounding third and headed home. Bring it, bring it in for us. <laughs> what were your thoughts about today's show? I think in moments of despair, I know that God fights for us. And I think that is, gives us courage to fight for others. We're all God's children. And I believe we live in a voyeuristic society. We like to get, look in to see what other people's problems are, but we don't want to fight to transform those problems. 
And so we've got to fight for something that's bigger than us. Very well said. Well, as always, very grateful to you all for, for being on board, as well as to all of our guests today. And now, the moment I've been waiting for. Here's three-time Dove Awards nominee. And you know, when you hear him sing, you'll know that this guy is following his calling. Please welcome 2004 American Idol finalist George Huff singing Brighter Days from his brand new CD, Miracle. to weigh us down and it's easy to let them steal your joy away it's always when you are the closest to almost getting through change seems far away Every day we live yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. you can't brace yourself and though tomorrow's another day no way your child for the show you're born in the project yes you get a scholarship to go to school yes for music right yes, yes. you run out of money you wind up homeless homeless and you know what I have to say that it's easy to see what's in front of you and I have to tell myself self and myself say hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you got to you got to get out that bed and you have to tell you have to know that in your heart that you could achieve everything that you set out for yourself and definitely I went out there to American Idol, and here I am standing right here with you, <laughs> Miss Jack. Oh he <laughs> knows so you know how to give back. You've been doing telephones for Katrina. Yes, I got the chance to go back home um, just I, I don't know how many times, and me and my dad have done interviews and stuff like that. Because you're from New Orleans. From New Orleans, Louisiana, and I've gotten to just, you know, go back and see home all over again, and slowly but surely it's coming together. You know, mm -hmm. I always say, uh, at the end of our show, that my mind is always open and my door is never closed. Mm. I want you to remember that too. This yes, door is never closed. Oh you are, my you God. and you are always <laughs> welcome at our table I'm gonna here. Cry. I'm going to cry. You do whatever you, so you want. Whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you. 